Góðu gestir, ætlum nú að fara að byrja þetta og fundunni verður haldin á ennsku, það er hérna með okkur Tim Karlsson frá Klavistur og við hérna þar að leiðandi verðum við með náttúrulega erindið og síðan Pattborg sem ræður á eftir á ennsku. Ladies and gentlemen, Icelandic Startups, NSA Ventures and Nasdaq Iceland warmly welcome you to this First North event. Our intention here today is to explore the opportunities that the First North market can offer small and medium-sized companies. First North in the Nordics has, in recent years, very successfully brought together investors and growth companies. And we believe that we can replicate this success here in Iceland. Currently, there are around, and in fact, in excess of 200 companies listed on First North in the Nordics. Last year alone, more than 60 companies were listed, and eight companies transferred from First North to the main market. Since 2007, nearly 40 companies have moved from First North to the main market, illustrating the transformative role of this marketplace. And what better way to explore the challenges and the benefits of listing on First North than to hear a real life story straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, from a company listed on First North. And with us here today is Jim Carlson, the CEO of Clavister, a company which provides network security solutions and is listed on First North Stockholm. Clavister was listed in May 2014 and has since then enjoyed great success on First North. Yet, Icelandic companies with a similar profile and finding themselves in a similar situation as Clavister did in early 2014, have up to this point been hesitant in entertaining the thought of an IPO and listing on First North. I therefore think that it is particularly interesting for us here today to hear Jim tell the story of Clavister. I will now hand over to Salome Guðmundsdóttir, the CEO of Icelandic Startups, who is our moderator here today. Salome. Thank you, Paul. Dear guests, welcome. It's an honor to have been invited to moderate today's discussions uh, about listings and investments on Nasdaq First North Market. Before we continue, I'd like to do uh, just a small test. How many of you, and just raise your hands, have logged into um, a free Wi-Fi during your travel abroad, say at hotels, restaurants, pubs? Does it ring a bell? Exactly. And, and probably some of you also use the same password for various logins or systems? Well, maybe after listening to Jim, you'll think twice. But um, to kick off the event, we have Jim Carlson, the CEO of Clavister, Swedish IT company, and he'll give us his insights on the listing process and its effect on uh, Clavister operations. And after his talk, he'll join us for um, panel discussions on the subject. So we expect uh, lively discussions and we will accept questions at the end. So without no further hesitations, let me introduce Jim. Welcome. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you to having this opportunity to come here. Uh, and this is the first time I am in Iceland, but for sure not the last time. I, I hope the storm comes earlier, so I have to cancel, I can stay here for a few days. Uh, I'm going to 
do like this. I'll, I'll give you 15, 20 minutes about the company so you understand the reason why we took to go into a public market. And uh, I'll give you some uh, pros and cons afterwards, personal feelings of uh, being listed. And uh, I'll save some, some of that for the panel discussion. So and do you have questions? Just interrupt me. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm here for you. So Cleverster, we are a company who was founded in 1997 uh, in the north of Sweden. Started as a professional services company doing security services for the Swedish defense. So we started up to do a secure communication be in between military vehicles. And uh, it's placed in Övik, where we have a BAR. We have a couple of big industries in, in Örnsköldsvik. Uh, we have customers around the globe, 25,000 customers, mainly small customers. Uh, but we have some big ones, uh, 80 people, 80 plus in Övik, mainly development. We are 15 in Stockholm and 25, 30 in China. And then we have partners around in the, some specific areas. And as uh, you heard, we're doing network security. Kind of when you have a company to internet, you put a box in so you secure the traffic in and out from the company. Or when you're out traveling, you, you can secure the communication between your laptop or whatever you use to the company. We do not do authentication, like when you do when you authenticate yourself into a bank or whatever. So we, we do the secure communication. And uh, some examples could be when you take the ferry in Sweden between Sweden and Norway. Uh, sorry, yeah, we're even there. Uh, Sweden and Stockholm and Helsinki. We do secure communication for the audience, everybody in the boat, the restaurants, and it, it connects through Wi-Fi from when you are in harbor to 2G, 3G, satellite, so the user doesn't see the change. That's one type of solution. Another type, this is from the Volvo Ocean Race. So we make the free Wi-Fi, or secure Wi-Fi, I would say. So the audience can have some, some uh, access to the Wi-Fi, but we can take away so they can't download the application and use HD. And we, we can act as a traffic police. So maybe the, the teams, they'd like to have more bandwidth because they're going to transport films and movies from the competition. So we can allocate different types of communication to different types of users. And uh, another example, it's the, where we started to have a secure communication in between vehicles and even inside the vehicle when you communicate with each other, and between the vehicle and the central station. So that's the kind of a communication security we've done, examples. And to give an idea, uh, or the reason, one of the main reasons to go in public is this. This is from the World Economic Development Forum in Davos in January, where they map out the likelihood that global things can happen, who have an eff effect on the global economical, economical market. And this is the impact. So you map out like the, it's hard to read, but failure of urban planning, quite a high likelihood, but the impact from a, from a financial perspective is not that big. And then you map out the big things are happening. And one thing is coming in, it's cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is on the table on all enterprise companies and governments today. So it's, it is important. In, in some countries, even more important, like after what's happened with uh, when NSA started to tap information from, from Merkel, for example. She, Germany. So in Germany, this is uh, hot. In South America, it's important. And another thing was happening. It's the Internet of Things and the massive deployment of Internet of Things. And it gives a headache for the operators. How shall we manage all the IoT stuff that comes up? Everything will be connected. Cars and security will be an uh, important thing. Not just as a security, as a security, but for the brand of the company who connects stuff to the Internet. We all know what happened with VAG, with uh, Volkswagen. It could be that the supplier delivers software who is not good, and they use that software for the cars. It doesn't matter. It's going to be Volkswagen who have the problem, not the supplier, because they have the brands. So, 
So when you connect things to the internet, you need to be sure that it's secure. And this is a typical, well, people who know the telco, a traditional telco system. We have been using the telecom system for calling. But what's happening now, it's we use the telco infrastructure for everything without calling it. It's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. As you say, when you go out traveling, you go to Starbucks or whatever to get a free Wi-Fi. And you send pictures. And uh, so you, the load of this infrastructure is heavy. So then it starts to come up like small cells of Wi-Fi stations. And it creates new business opportunities in this infrastructure. I think there's one million uh, apps now on these phones. And the traffic here, it, it uh, doubles every 18 months. So uh, then you can ask, what do Clavister have in this space to do? Well, we designed a software-based security gateway for the military uh, on, without any, any own operating system, which means it's very, very small. So you can have a complete software security gateway on a USB stick. And that gives some advantages. First of all, this is an example for our com colleagues, like Juniper, Cisco, Palo Alto. It's, all of them are based on an open operating system. So this gives us a, a, a product that is extremely fast in some areas. And we have a very good relation with Intel. So Intel is a very tight partner to us. So, so we work in the development with them. We are, being a small company, in, we, Intel uses us as an enabler to sell their uh, high-speed processors. And one example from, uh, if, you know, if you are in the IT space, you, you recognize Heart, Heartbleed or Ghost. It's that global uh, hacks has been done. And normally they go through the operating system. So this is on the left side, example of suppliers in our space. So we were the, comp the only company who were not affected when these came out, which means that if you are a system integrator or an administrator at the company, you don't have to upgrade or update the program. Cisco is a big company. They went out to say in January, they had to release 248 security patches. They had to go out to the customer and say, you have to patch your system to be secure. Same as you when you have to update your mobile phone. And also, another thing with our software, it's so small, so we can put it in IoT stuff. But even though we have a good product and a good technology, uh, previous, when I, I joined Clavister uh, two years ago, I started to work with Clavister before, six months before we went into the market. In my background, I had another company doing like bank IDs, and we sold that to Intel five years ago. And it learned me a lot about go-to-market strategies. We have been working as in the strategy that many companies do. It doesn't matter what you are. You have a distributor, a reseller, and going to the customer and enterprise. This creates a challenge, which we talk about push-pull. You have to educate the customers so they come to you and say, hey, I'd like to buy a Clavister. You have to educate the distributors and the resellers. So it's a very cost, costly business model. And we compete with the big American guys with tons of money. So uh, to, to move out of that, we either had to have a lot of money to hire a lot of inside sales people in Ireland, sales rep, or find another way. So we, we started to work with changing the business model to go into using our technology in other, in other things, like in the telco, I'll come back to this. And to be able to move into talk with, with the big companies, it helped a lot to be public. So what we, I'll come back to that, we, we, what we, uh, we, we signed an agreement with a, what we call a TEM, Telecom, Manufacturer, and there are four of them in the world, big ones Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, and Alcatel Lucent. And now Lucent and Nokia is one company. And uh, so they will use our technology in, so when, when, when they will sell a base station, there will be a security gateway inside that. 
And this was one of the reasons to be going public. Because we had a technology they liked, but we also knew that being able to uh, put our technology in their products, they wanted to have uh, another well, a trustworthy company to work with. So what we do here, uh, if this is a mobile phone, it connects to the, to the base stations. It connects to a base, this is, could be like an operator. So what we will do now, it's put a security to secure all the communication in between the base stations and the operators. And also the, the traffic goes out to the internet or to, to other operators and also to secure uh, their local systems. So this was an agreement we signed, but we were not allowed to disclose it. So one of the challenges being public is to sometimes you're not allowed from the customer side to disclose what you've done. And there will be like 30 million cars connected to the internet. Year 2020, that comes from Nokia. Uh, this agreement we signed the 6th of June last year. And last week we were al allowed to announce it to the market. There's one challenge when you go into the market. We, we signed a big agreement. I know that NASCA said we need to disclose what agreement, what the agreement, what the value of it, who the partner is. But the customer said, no, you're not allowed to disclose because of they were sitting in negotiation to buy Alcatel Lucent. Uh, I'll go through this fast. Uh, another agreement we signed, and this is also uh, Due to we being public, we got the opportunity to sign an agreement with Canon. We worked with Canon for eight, nine months, and they are taking away two US partners uh, or suppliers. And uh, in Japan, I think the biggest, the second biggest security market in the world. And uh, they will start to distribu dis distribute Clavister products from Q1 this year. And that's also a, 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 I would say a small challenge uh, when you go to communication. We have to coordinate all the information to go out on the market at the same time. That we have signed the agreement. We had a big launch at the embassy in, in Tokyo, 80 people coming. And to manage everything without saying so much to so many people, that's uh, a thing we need to work with in the internal process. You'd like to go out in town and say, shit, we have the, the biggest deal but we are not allowed, because we have to wait until we are in Tokyo. And also coordinate with the press or the customers' PR uh, people. This help, uh, I mean, these two, coming back to the business model, this is also important for us. Uh, this is the way we've been working. We are using these contracts to get the bigger trust on the left side. So now we see the sales is growing in the left side, in the traditional two-tier market. Because we can use Canon. I can go to a big Swedish company. I can go to H&M or Ikea and say, Canon had chosen us. And then we can go back to that and say, at least we can talk so you can see what we have. That was hard before. So going public, get access to big customers, and then go back to the traditional business model. It's, a way, it's helping us a lot. Uh, and I think I, a, a few about I. Uh, we started when we before going like six months before, <laughs> and we were, worked with a local uh, advisor called Remium who helped us to go through what we have to do before going public. I think we had a, we had a good uh, uh, structure from the beginning. Uh, there were some things we, we, we did a, a, a light DD, uh, a legal DD from a local Becky McKinsey. And we put all the formalities in, in place. Most of them we had. We had to work a little bit with the, with the code of conduct and the ethics and have that in place. But I guess most of the companies have a good, they do this quite good. It's put it in a process. 
and put it timely with the reporting. The more... Uh, yeah, and also we did nothing. We did a reverse acquisition. We, there's a company who had 3,000 stock owners. So we, we acquired them and changed. So we, it's easier or faster way to go into the market. Then we had 3,000 stock owners from the beginning. Uh, I spent some time with trying to find out, or I, I met a few companies, quite a many companies, who had been listed before, one year before, to see what experience do we have, what was good, what was bad, uh, what the three biggest challenges. So I spent some time to understand what they would do different if they would do it again. Uh, and try to go on that list first. Um, we also secured some financing from uh, two big investors, so we had that for one year. Uh, of course, the training was important from Nasdaq. What I would spend more time today is to the training internally, uh, in terms of managing information. Uh, to put to put the company description, some peop, some companies have a really good description, some don't. To put that takes some time. It's important to do it, but uh, we wanted to meet up if as we would go for the small cap. Uh, so we we tried to do maybe a little bit too much. Uh, but it was also a good way to have all the different departments within the organization to work together. So we have the same view on where we're going. And that's also because we, we are in a shift of changing business model. And that's a, a company has been running for 15 years and then changing go-to-market strategy. Clavis is a typical Swedish technical product-oriented company, not so good in marketing. So that's a, a culture way. And that's... That is a, a big job. I would spend more time in that, maybe in, in the culture, if I would do it again, to have everybody to understand what it means. And it's, it's this training of the employees and having a process for communication and have everybody to understand what it means, uh, what it means to be public, uh, both the, the good things and the challenging things. Uh, even now, uh, what is an insider? What is a key deal? What's the effect for the market? Because when you are a development team, today we have 30, 25 people working with development for Nokia, but they were not al allowed to name, say the name Nokia for one year. It's hard. We have meetings with them, and uh, so it's easy with that it slips out. So I was surprised last week, I mean, Nokia and Alcatel Lucent, it's the biggest telecom manufacturer in the world now. Maybe with Huawei, is maybe the same size now. The guy who is manager, he's manager for security and IoT. He took, he took time to go up to Övik for two days. And he has a lot of things to do now. And we went out in the press and said, now we have signed this agreement, this Nokia. And the stock went down. So sometimes I don't really understand uh, the behavior of what's... And in fact, this morning it went up 6%. I guess this is an Iceland effect. <laughs> so I need to come here often. Uh, but this is hard. I mean, this is a thing we have... We're still working with. How shall we manage the communication within the company, within the partners? And in fact, I had a discussion with Remium, who's our uh, advisor, when we signed the agreement with Nokia. He said, now we're signing that, and we wanted to go out on Monday with a press release, but we we're not allowed. So we said, we can't say who it is. And, they, and no one really knew. We, I talked with Nasdaq, I talked with Remium. They don't want us to announce it. And I don't, re, I don't want to... This is a big, big chance for us. So I had to... Sometimes you have to take a fight also with, with, uh, with Nasdaq. This is important for us. And, but if you have a good dialogue, that's, that's, that's good. Uh, and I would also, to have a good uh, person who is an IR manager or running the business is, is, uh, 
I think that's important. I, I put a picture about some pros and cons, but for us, for us, create trust was uh, extremely important. To create the trust so we can go out. And then suddenly, uh, the big customers like Canon say, well, now you're, you're public, then I trust your owners will do whatever they have to do so you can fulfill our. Before being, uh, uh, especially Clevester, had a, uh, if you know the history, it's hard <laughs> because then say, oh, well, I know Clevester, no, no. If you have a company that's been a, lying, run as a, like a jet ski, it's hard to get trust if you're going to go for a long-term relationship. Uh, so visibility, you can, I mean, it's, it's, it's night and day. And also a lot of investors, uh, we have like 4,000 uh, stock owners. We see them also as customers coming up. Uh, and also uh, we are hiring now, we're trying, I would say, we're trying to hire one person per week now. And we couldn't do that without uh, being on the stock market. It, it's, it, uh, the, the challenge we have is the onboarding, to have them to come into the team without destroying the organization. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's our internal biggest challenge to hire people, and especially being in Ernst Week where we have no university. So we open up a small uh, office in Ume where we have uh, direct access to the university. <laughs> and uh, I would say long-term committed owners is for me really good to have. Uh, we, have one, we, we, we are going to, to in Q3, uh, Q3, Q4, I would say, go to the um, small cap, to the bigger list. And that's because of a lot of the uh, funds are not allowed to put so much money in the first note. So we are restarting this process again and go through what, what do we need to go on the bigger market. If you go look at the downsides, or the, it's the, the cost, increased cost. Uh, and I would say that there's some, what I talked about, some specific, it depends what you, but some specific deals. We also have signed an agreement with the biggest defense company in the world, but we can't disclose it. And that, that is, seems to be okay. But we, there is, where is the line? Could be a chance. I would say this one and the, the increased expenses, reduced internal communication openness, or reduced hemma. What do you say? It it's creates some challenges when you run the company. You'd like to be enthusiastic and to explain what we're doing. We have new opportunities. We're going to do this and now. And I like to when we came, like we do in Brazil. I like to tell everybody what's happening, and that kills it a little bit. So you can say, say a little bit, but you have to tell all the markets at the same time. So that's, I would say, the, the, the biggest challenge for me, or for us, it's the internal communication openness. We need to find a better way to handle that, uh, so, we don't, so we don't be like, too stiff. And uh, uh, I, the increased ex expenses, but that's, I can put that in marketing, so it's more of a marketing stuff. So it's, I don't know, it depends how you look at it. Uh, but I got a question yesterday, would you do it again? Yes, absolutely. I will put some more time in some areas, but I will do it again. Uh. One additional question on that point. If you would do it again, would you go directly to the small cap or first north again? Uh, it, I, 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 was, I would go to uh, first north. I would small. It, well, it, it depends what kind of company. But cleverest as is, I would do the same trip. It's, it's a good learning also for taking the next step, I think. So that was all for me. Did I make it in? Yeah. So thank you, Tim, for your uh, interesting insights to the process. To the panel, I'd like to invite Helga Valfels, the CEO of NSA Venture Fund, Brynja Gummersdóttir, founder and CEO of Asaso, Svampe Thorotsen, partner and chair of the board of directors at KPMG, 
and Sigurður Óli Hákonarsson, Corporate Banking at Íslandsbanki. Welcome. So, the first question, um, Jim, what, uh, how long did it take the company to get it eligible for listing? Uh, I would say it took us six months. Six months? Six to nine months, yeah. Since you decided to well, list Until it. we decided. I think we, we started had a workshop about uh, the possibilities we have the, with the technology on a global basis. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so the, the decision to go public was quite f fast to take, mm -hmm. like a weekend. <laughs> but to prepare to be out there, that, that uh, was a bigger deal. All right. And, uh, and when you um, applied, what was the status of the company um, when you decided to list it? How, de how developed was the structure uh, in terms of policies and processes? And, uh, and did you, for example, have an experienced board member when it comes to listed companies at that time? Yeah, what uh, the company has been, uh, as the company was 10, 10, 12 years old, there was a good structure in the company. Uh, but what, what we did, we hired, uh, at the same time, when I joined, I had a new, the board was, changed, so we have a, a new lawyer. And I also hired my old CFO, who had been a CFO for, for Sun and Bonn, had a good experience. And uh, we also, so, so we hired like four or five people who had experience from, from not necessarily as listed company, but uh, bigger companies with a well structure. All right. And if on practical notes, could you just take us briefly through the process of of listing the company? I mean, what people need to be involved? What documents do you need? And what requirements do you need to fulfill? Where do you start? Oh, that, <laughs> uh, we started to, to ask for a list, what we need to have from the compliance view. Mm -hmm. This we need to do. And then also we, at the same time, looked at what do we want to do from, from mm -hmm. the business view. And a lot of uh, the, ma the management team was, of course, involved, the product management and uh, the border were worked a lot. We had the, and the IR guy who has been with the company for a long time. So we, we involved quite a lot of people. Uh, but I would next time involve everybody in an earlier stage mm -hmm. in workshops to understand what, what does this mean. Mm -hmm. Because for some people it came as a surprise, mm -hmm. especially on the communication and information side. So that, that's something everybody needs to understand better. I would do that today, but uh, we involved maybe 10 people right. internally. And would you say that there is a perfect timing for listing a company on Nasdaq First North? I guess that, uh, I don't know if it's perfect, but there's a time for everybody to, we should have done it earlier, to be honest. Uh, but. For me, it was good. I joined the company six months before, so <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect timing for me. <laughs> yeah. right. I, I guess it's up to everybody, all companies, where you are, what do you do, uh, what kind of strategies you have. So, mm -hmm. And, and um, you must engage um, a certified advisor yep. uh, during the admission process. How did you choose yours? Friends, friend, <laughs> to be honest. We, we, in fact, we used Remium and we asked a couple of uh, companies who had been listed before mm -hmm. and they had good experience with them. And we did a, uh, we checked with a couple of them, so they were right in price, but in fact, we had one who knew one who had a good relation that we could trust. So, as many things, you have a good trust in some people and then you continue to work with them. Mm -hmm. And it's been good for us. Okay. So, I would like to direct my question to Sigurður Ole. Um, we've often heard that a lot of a lot can be learned from the Swedish first North market, and apparently, certified advisors p have played a big role in building that market. And we see the same thing happening currently in Finland. Um, in Iceland, there are five companies listed as certified advisors, and one of them is Islandsbanki. 
What is your future vision, Seudel, for the development and structure of First North Iceland? And maybe a little insight into the role of a, of a uh, CA. Uh, yes. Uh, well, maybe to start, the First North market in Iceland has been quite dormant mm -hmm. for the past few years. We have mm -hmm. two companies right now listed on the First North market. Uh, so uh, basically the, the task is a bit to, to build up a market that functions. Uh, we at Islandsbank have been quite active in the, in the listing uh, of companies over the past few years. We have had five listings on the main market out of 12 uh, the past couple of years. Uh, but as I said, the task on the, on the first north market is a bit to uh, build up the market. And to do that, you need both the supply side of the market uh, companies that will will be uh, investment opportunities, and you also need uh, you also need the demand side, the investors. Mm -hmm. uh, so, looking at the investor side, we have the biggest investors on the listed market are the pension funds, owning some 35, 40 percent of the of the listed equities. Uh, there was a bit of a catalyst uh, on their side last summer when there was a, uh, their uh, flexibility or their, uh, uh, yeah, their flexibility to, to invest in, in first north listed companies was increased by 5% of their net assets, mm -hmm. uh, translating to some 160 billion ISK. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we feel there is interest from the pension fund community to, to activate this, this market. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm optimistic regarding, regarding that. Then you have the mutual funds and uh, individuals, uh, which should benefit for, for uh, a broader, broader array of companies than they have on the, on the main market. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but on that side, the key thing for the mutual funds and the individuals is liquidity. So you need that. That's not as much of a problem at the pension fund side. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of the issuers, uh, I think the, the first north market should suit uh, uh, many companies uh, that are maybe lacking in size in going into the main market. But this is a more flexible form of market. You enjoy the benefits, the liquidity, the quality stamp, and so forth. Uh, and you have more uh, lax regulatory framework and less cost. So all in all, I'm, I'm very optimistic on the First North market. Okay. And how do you think Íslandsbanki can support companies that choose to be listed on First North? Uh, Íslandsbanki is a universal bank. Mm -hmm. so, so we have uh, services on a very, very broad area of services. Uh, obviously, as a certified advisor, we would uh, assist companies regarding the listing journey from start until, until or, or, and also after listing, mm -hmm. uh, advising and assisting companies in the regulatory framework, uh, assisting on the, on the due diligence, on the, on the company descriptions, and, and, and adjusting the, the company structure to the listed framework. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have... Uh, 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 we have a uh, connection to investors on, on many fronts. I mean, we are a universal bank. We have connections through bank branches, through our broker side, obviously from the corporate finance side, mm -hmm. from the asset management side. Uh, we have, as a bank, the ability to be a liquidity provider or market maker for companies. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a strong research department with six analysts. And that's an important part that, that you get the research mm -hmm. uh, department uh, mm -hmm. into the project. Mm -hmm. We have the ability to underwrite on a case-by-case -case basis. So, mm -hmm. okay. and, and out of curiosity, what, what is the cost of these services? What do you estimate? Yes. Uh, you, you could maybe segregate the cost in, in maybe start, yeah. start cost, maybe first year cost and then the ongoing cost. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the heavier part is the, is the startup cost. Uh, we, you have the fees to the, to, to the NASDAQ and, and security depository. Mm -hmm. 
but the biggest items are probably uh, doing due diligence, uh, doing that, and also also hiring a certified advisor and getting the service of, of, of that. Yeah. Then you have the ongoing cost of, of fees to the security exchange and so forth. Uh, it's a bit difficult yeah. to put some number on it because it's, it depends on on the company structure, on the amount of work you need to adjust the company to the listed environment, mm. uh, the size of the company, the complexity of the company, the amount of due diligence work you need. Mm. So it varies from a company to company basis, mm. but I mean, this is always much le or less costly as listing on the main market. Mm. You can say that. Uh, and to talking from the standpoint of Islands Banki, mm. Our fees would be success-based fully or, or, or mainly. Okay, thank you. And Svampjot, uh, KPMG serves a diverse group of companies and has put emphasis on supporting entrepreneurship and innovation. How could First North be useful for the companies you work with? I think the, uh, the First North market could be extremely uh, important for companies being able to access or get to the market at an earlier stage than would otherwise be on the main market, for sure. And, um, and uh, I mean, all of the, all of the benefits that, that Jim mentioned for, for, for his company are very relevant uh, for, for, for a lot of Icelandic mid-sized companies and fast-growing companies that we're working with. The access to capital, the credibility you get from a listing, and, and, and exposure you get through that. So I think that's, that's extremely important to develop that market. It's also very important to, to have a market that, that is different from the main market. Uh, in my own experience, I was the CEO of uh, Flaga Medcare when we went to market and listing in 2003. And uh, the problem we had when we entered the market in 2003, we were uh, the smallest company there. And then the market capitalization of the other companies leading up to year 2008 grew uh, tremendously. And we were sort of, we were just too small. We were in a different league. And it is very important mm -hmm. that, that these uh, growth companies, the smaller companies, they are looked at, at in a different league, in a different list, with different emphasis. We just, you don't fit, you know, a small growth company coming into market doesn't fit with Iceland Air or the banks when they come in, or, or, or some of the uh, sort of bigger international companies. So it's very important to have a list where you have a slightly different focus, you're looking for growth, you're looking for, you know, at a different level at these companies. Mm -hmm. So I think that is important. Okay. And what is KPMG's role in the process and how can you support the companies that choose to be listed on First North? Um, as an advisory company, I think our, our main value is in the, is in the phase leading up to, leading up to the, the listing. The, f the six months that Jim talked about, the mm -hmm. sort of IPO readiness mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. and 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 we're primarily uh, advisors, so so we not only can can sort of look at you know what what you need to look like before you get listed, but also as management consultants and and and, and financial experts, we can help really dig into what needs to be fixed at the company level and and, and help them get ready, prepared. And, and then go through the process. So I think sort of our main value is in, in, in that stage up to the actual listing, whereas the bank's expertise is basically, you know, on most value is selling the securities, running the books, mm -hmm. uh, getting the placements, the, mm -hmm. the, the underwriting, and the, and, and the market maker post, mm -hmm. post listing. So I think that, that's sort of where we specialize more of the preparation stages. Okay. Thank you. Um, Listing, we've been talking about this listing, opens up many opportunities, um, including ones to strengthen the company's operations and image. And listed companies, they typically have access to a wider range of funding alternatives and greater visibility. And of course, the decision to list also comes with obligations. And since listed companies must comply with a certain legal and regulatory framework. But Brynja, in your opinion, what are the pros and cons of being listed on First North Iceland? And is it perhaps a matter of the correct timing during the growth phase? And also maybe in particular compared to raise funding outside the market? Well, <clears throat> I don't think I'm the best person to be here because I haven't seen the light. <laughs> um, 
I, because before I started my company, I was working with two listed company, and I still remember the work around it. And it's uh, still, I think it's too expensive, too much work, at least for me. And I would rather spend my time on making some more money. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, it is very important to have this opportunity because, of course, companies are diff different. And uh, for me, it has been easy to get money. Of course, it has, uh, I have spent a lot of time, but we have raised, I think, about 700 Iceland krona. Just, I just go by myself, I just pick up the phone and call investors. So for me, it hasn't been, I, as, as I say, I haven't seen a light. I almost saw a light when I listened to you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, still, I haven't seen a light because it changed the company a lot. And when you have a fast-growing company, you want everyone on the board in a team to be work to, working together. And so, at least for me, I haven't seen a light, but I think it's very important to have a different ways to finance your company. So, I'm very happy that the first north is available, because maybe after six months, something changes in our company, and I would like to join. But still, I remember all the time and the effort and the expense <laughs> to be listed, to be honest. Thank you. Tim, would you like to elaborate on this? And, and well, I, I, do <laughs> I do understand you uh, in this. And uh, because previous to this, I had my company, we were 50 of us when Intel acquired us. And we were in a stage to see what we were, we have, were in the business for eight, nine years. And we did this bank ID centers for all the banks. When you log in, you can do like two-factor authentication. And I talked with a lot of uh, Swedish investors. And we, in Sweden, we, are, we are, tend to go into the balance sheet and say, how much do you make today, tomorrow? Can you cut some costs? And so, this is not, because I had a little light at that time. <laughs> so I said, I'll go to the States, because they don't really understand, or I couldn't, I couldn't get out my message. And it was uh, completely different. So there where we met Intel. And they saw more of the opportunity of the technology in, other, in another perspective. Uh, so uh, when then we decided not to go public, to go directly to, uh, we, we were looking for money, but they ended up to acquire us. Uh, but it depends what you do, what, what, when in with Clavester we have the possibility, and it's not many times I see this, uh, the technology, uh, timing, because when the Clavester started to develop this, they didn't know what's going to happen in the IoT space, on the telco space. They happened to have a technology which is perfect fit for a certain. And the way to go out is to do, take whatever we can do in terms of visibility and trust. So that's why I think for us it, that's the, uh, the best way, was the best way. Mm -hmm. but, so, so by curiosity, what, what's your business? I'm in the IT business. Doing? So <laughs> so, we are making a software. Okay. I'm thinking of signing also. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. I hope it for a storm so I can do this. <laughs> Helka, I want to direct my questions to you. Um, would you say that local investors are interested in the first North market and, and, and why? And do you think it's valuable for investors to have companies listed on the market? Um, my experience now, I'm just speaking as a fund. Um, as a fund, we're very, very interested in the market, and we are very interested that some of our portfolio companies, including Brynjas, would look at listing as an option, because for us, we're as a fund and as an investor, we're looking for an exit. And we know a lot of our co-investors, who, which are angels and things like that, they like liquidity. You know, you invest in something and you want to be there for five, ten years, but it's nice to know that you can sell your investment if the opportunity arises. So I think just the liquidity provided by a market like First North is very, very good. And I really agree with Swampia's point, which he made earlier, about having two markets and the sort of high growth companies with international exposure are a different option to the, at least the Icelandic companies you see listed on um, First North. So I think it's no, on, on the main market. So I think it's very, very important to have the two markets. I think that was a good point. And also to Brynja, I just wanted to say, if you listen to Jim, being listed helps you sell. And I, th I know that's what you enjoy, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Somfit, um, Nordic companies are increasingly funding themselves via corporate bonds as an alternative to tra traditional uh, bank financing. Would you agree that First North is a more efficient alternative to the traditional bond markets for smaller and growing companies? Absolutely. Um, in particular, we, ha we, have <coughs> we have some, some bond issues that are really uh, placed originally with buy-to-hold investors. We have even, even, even restricted trading bonds, as it were, in terms of you have to have a license for buying uh, foreign currency-dominated bonds, etc., or, 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 or the result of that. So uh, there, are, there are definitely a number of issues where, where you're not necessarily looking for high liquidity, but you need the listing, in which case uh, the first North market is ideal. It's, it's lower cost, it's, it's, it's faster to execute, and, and, and you have the listing without the necessity of high volume trading. So you have the big bonds on the big market, as it were, but, but I think there is, there is ample space for, for, for various bond issues that need listing because of the investor community, the, the requirements they have, but not necessarily for the liquidity or trading, which where, 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 where First North is ideal. Okay. Uh, and Seori, would you agree? And uh, yes, uh, in a way, mm -hmm. it, it could function, but as Svempet says, the, if, you, if you're not thinking about liquidity, uh, and still, I mean, if you, if you uh, issue bonds on the, on the first note market, you are undergoing much of the same requirements as issuing equity on the market, given that you're not listed beforehand. So that, that's a point to consider. You mm -hmm. need to undergo the similar requirements and mm -hmm. have a certain advice advisor and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. What investors do you think will be active on First North Market? Uh, uh, I mean, probably a similar mix as in the, in the main market. As I said earlier, the, the pension funds are, are quite, quite, quite a big uh, mm -hmm. investor on the main market, listed market. Uh, they will be also a big part of the First North Market. Uh, the bigger pension funds will look at the, the bigger companies. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if you think about the typical range of companies, maybe on the scale of one to five billion ISK in market cap. Uh, so the bigger pension funds will look at the, the higher rents there. The smaller pension funds will look at, the, look at the smaller companies, I would assume. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, uh, the pension funds will look at smaller t ticket sizes when investing in a listed company of First North, mm -hmm. much smaller than they would otherwise if mm -hmm. they were looking at an unlisted company. Mm -hmm. uh, then you will have the, have the uh, mutual funds and, and basically I think all or most of them have in their investment guidelines as is the capacity to invest in First North listed companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have the individuals that, that will mm -hmm maybe take a, take a more active role. We see that in, in Sweden, where they constitute some 50% of the turnover. Mm -hmm. They are very active. We could see that also in, in the ISTAT market. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the, for, the, for the individuals and the mutual funds, it's very important for them to have uh, some liquidity provider, possibly, or, or liquidity is, is, is very important there. Uh, so, yes, mm -hmm. I think there should be quite, a, quite an interest. And how do you think it could uh, affect investors if the market is not very active? Can it impact? Uh, I think it will, in fact, uh, affect the, the, the interest from the mutual funds mm -hmm. and the individuals mm -hmm. more than the pension funds. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Okay. So. Thank you. But it's, it's always, I mean, to get the active market, you need the investment opportunities exactly. and you need a broad array of companies. That's very important. Exactly. Thank you. Jim, um, you mentioned before um, that right before you were listed, you went IPO for 34 million Swedish kronas. Could you perhaps tell us a little bit about the strategy behind that? Um. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, just before we got listed, we we one the way we got listed is to find a company who had like three thousand stock owners, and uh, at the same time they guarantee the thirty four million coming from two main owners and all of the 
most of the 3,000 owners, they also joined this uh, reversed uh, acquisition. And um, the strategy behind that, it was we wanted to go onto the market quite fast. Mm -hmm. And also this was a way for us to have uh, a big number of uh, stock owners from the start. Okay, and, and when you were listed, did you need to draw up a company description or, or prospectus? Did you? Sorry. Did you need to? Uh, yeah, we draw need to. Up yeah, we did a good. We did a large job there because the listing was one thing, and then we wanted to because that's just as, as you said the start of it, and then you have to continue to market your company and go out. So we spent uh, quite a lot of work to mainly to get the uh, same view within the company where we're hitting and agree on that, mm -hmm. and that was the base for the prospect. And if you give the mic over to Helka, again, um, what are the aspects you need to consider when you're selling a company or shares, uh, listing versus trade sale? And um, do you think, yeah, if you just start by that. Yeah, um, I think as a fund, we have much more experience of trade sales. We've gone through several trade sales, um, both in Iceland and um, abroad over the last few years. Um, I think as a fund, the only experience we have of a listing is we sold our shares in Decode somewhere around the turn of the century, which was very good. It was actually a very good exit for us because we timed it well. So I think I would imagine the first thing, if you look at listing versus trade sale, is just a timing issue. Are the markets good? Is this a good time to list? And I truly believe that this is a good time to list in Iceland. As you look at the main market, it's been doing well. I think people and investors want something else and more to invest in. So we get asked by sort of angel investors and things like that, um, you know, do you have any companies that would be interesting for us to invest in? And, and I think if some of the high tech companies here were listed on First North, I think they could tap into that interest. So I think timing is a bit, very big consideration. I also think just in terms of the exit in terms of trade sale versus listing, in a trade sale you sort of, you can get maybe a higher valuation sometimes if you have the right synergies with, um, with the company. So I think, you know, for us, when we've gone into trade sales with companies, it's all about the value that the, uh, it, um, how it increases the acquirer's valuation. So we have to look at, we have to understand the acquiring company, what do they want, and will, is this a good fit for them? Whereas I think in a listing, it's more, much more a standalone case. Is this can this company stand on its own feet? Is it going to grow into the future? Does it have a portfolio of products, or is it just a one type of product? I think that also. Mm -hmm. And I would also imagine, for example, um, one of the companies that I'm on the board of is Infometor. Infometor is really, really well known in Iceland. Personally, I think. Um, this has not been discussed on the board, this is just my personal view, um, would be a perfect <laughs> company to list because it is so well known in the Icelandic market and I think it could be a really, and it's well run and it's about ed education and technology, so it would be a nice um, stock to own and that's the type of companies I'd want to see listed from our portfolio. Would you say that First North Iceland might be a good way for you then to exit a company? And would it be a possibility for you to keep sharing companies that will be listed and follow them at least in the beginning? Or would it always need to be an exit on your behalf? No, I think we can do partial exits. We've done that even with trade sales or we've sold to a group of investors and only sold part of our um, shares. I think for us that would be work very well because especially if we really believe in the company, then we could sort of gradually earn our upside and so we wouldn't have to um, sell everything beforehand. So for us, that would be the ideal situation. Jim, again, um, what's the combination of shareholder and clavister in terms of types of investors? I mean, private equity, um, pension funds, and international investors. So we, we had before, pre-IPO, we had two in uh, funds coming in. So, uh, SC Bank was one of them, and they went in pre-IPO, and then the plan is for them to, uh, to leave as an owner on a controlled way. And they've got stepped out now of half of that. And today I think we have, uh, I'm glad that we have Robur, one of the uh, well-known investor fund who came in a couple of months ago. And now we've, we see a, a shift uh, to more uh, funds coming in in the company. Uh, we have 35% from, from the founders and the very close to the founders. And the, they try to keep, but more and more funds and bigger, uh, bigger investors 
is coming into the company. Okay, what would you say was their main motive for investing in Clavister to influence the operations? I think the, the business opportunity mm -hmm. for uh, being a, a player in the, in the glo global, global space. Mm -hmm. We have one thing, since what's happened after 9-11, all the American security companies needs to open up a back door so NSA can tap out the information. So that's a law. Okay, so, and that, uh, and we don't have that. So we are one of the few companies still in the world who does, doesn't have a backdoor. Mm -hmm. In Sweden, we don't really care. And some countries care, but some countries care. Germany, for example, mm -hmm. or South America, or Asia, Japan, China, they'd like to be able to communicate without anybody listening. <laughs> and that comes to another dimension when you come to the IoT. Space. So, so I think some people see there is an opportunity here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's why they're coming in. Mm -hmm. And that's also, that's what I like, they're coming in a long term. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Sigurður, Ole, how can we increase and encourage trading on First North? Uh, well, uh, the main thing is uh, there are a couple of ways. Uh, one, of, one important way is to get research interest, research material on the companies listed. Uh, then obviously you need the interesting companies listed on the market. So it's a bit, it's a, the two go, go, go together a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to see uh, a wide variety of interesting companies on the market. That, that's a big thing. When you have that, you have the interest from the demand side, you have the research inside, uh, interest and, and, and the liquidity in active trading. Mm -hmm. Then it follows, it, the market becomes mm -hmm. more attractive for new mm -hmm. companies to list. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if we look 15 years back, we had some 75 companies listed mm -hmm. on the market in, in very many sectors. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the, the first North market could be a sort of pathway for getting more diversity. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, the main point is, is having an active market with interesting companies mm -hmm. and, and research interest mm -hmm. and so forth okay. and liquidity. Thank you. Svanbjörn, would you agree? Yes, absolutely. We, we need more companies there to get attention and to get, you know, a, an interesting list there and, and get the attention of, of investors. So. More companies, uh, more research, that will come together, I think. But I think the opportunity is there, definitely. Okay. And Helga, what do you think it takes for more companies to look at First North as a viable option for growth? <laughs> what incentives do we need? Um, I, I think this has been said a million times. Somebody needs to be first. I think the first company that lists now after the sort of the crisis, I think they're going to get a lot of attention. And I think somebody has to be brave and lead the way. So I think that... Um, and as soon as you have one success story, I think m m more companies will um, come along. So I think whatever company is listed first, we have to do it really, really well. And the advisors and the banks and the funds and investors all have to work together and make sure that that's a good listing. Mm -hmm. And Brynja, what would it take for you to consider listing on First North? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me, it's uh, very, very important to listen to a guy like him. <laughs> Because uh, the only thing when uh, someone is talking about First North, uh, people are talking about what do you have to do, what is it expensive, instead of what is the value. So <laughs> at least for me to be here in today, to, today, I will change maybe my mind. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Exactly. <laughs> because uh, you are more visible. And uh, <laughs> of course, uh, the strange thing about investor in Iceland is everyone remember the IT market in the year of 2000. Mm -hmm. But no one remembers what happened to a lot of big companies in 2008. When, for example, uh, I'm not going to take some names, but a lot of companies, uh, creditor had to, uh, lost a lot of money. But when they go to the market now, everyone goes running to buy shares. But everyone remembers what happens in 2000 in IT market. So instead of... Uh, at least I would love that people would forget the year of 2000 <laughs> because I think the opportunity in the IT market is so big and it changes so rapidly and uh, so 
If I go to the market, I hope that all of you are going to buy shares. <laughs> so at least I have changed my mind a little bit. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Well, Helga, I, I think it's safe to say that First North hasn't been an obvious platform for, for Icelandic startups looking for capital yet. Um, why do you think that is the fact? And, and do you think the startup community leaders, such as Icelandic startups, could help change that? Um, yes, I, I think the reason it hasn't been an obvious market is because you don't have really any high growth um, sort of technology companies listed on First North mm -hmm. yet. Um, so and, and again, you know, the, the bubble burst. We had a grey sort of trading market here in um, 99, 2000. A lot of people made money. A lot of people lost money. Not nearly as much as they lost in 2008, but they still lost money. So I think, you know, it's um, sort of shares in um, uh, tech companies do have, I think, as Brynja said, you know, a sort of a bad history. But a lot since 2000, a lot of people, a lot of investors have made a lot of money investing in technology. So I think it's a good asset class to invest in. And I think, um, as I say, I think it's just a matter of time before it becomes a viable option. I think definitely Icelandic startups could help with having meetings like this. Um, I know one of the things we tried to get for this meeting was we would try to get an, a, a, an investor who had exited through a listing, didn't find one, but I think next meeting we should try to do that as well and hear their stories because I think it's really important to hear success stories and, um, and honest stories as we've heard from Jim. Mm -hmm. And Svanbjörn, do you think that First North can support innovation? <clears throat> Uh, yes, because of the exposure and access to funds, mm -hmm. it can encourage innovation. Innovative companies coming in there uh, definitely will, I think, help them grow, help them get exposure, help them sell even internationally, as, as Jim's uh, you know, story is. I think it's also important to bear in mind that, that First North not only can be an interesting uh, venue for, for high technology and growth companies, it can also be a, a venue for capital intensive companies. We have, we have a, a, a number of companies here doing great things that requires uh, big investments mm -hmm. in, 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 in capital, building factories, etc. This can also be uh, a venue for them or, or, or a platform for them to raise funds for such uh, investments. So it's not only, only for the high tech companies, there is, there is a broader, uh, I think, uh, range that, that First North offers. We should keep that in mind. Thank you. And Jim, um, what advice would you give to those considering joining First North in terms of communication with future investors? Uh, I think what's, when you come into the First North or the finance area, it's a very strong focus on, on information who is, who is related to the finance situation and driving business, not to the actually what you're delivering. So it, it tends to be a finance-based communication and from in, anyway, in, in our company. Uh, so I try to, the reason we communicate to the market is because we have a product mm -hmm. who, is, who fits for, for, for the companies. And we need to really f focus on the offering we have, not the information so much. <laughs> of course, we need to inform the finance market, but to go out to the market, to the customer, say, this, now we have this function, we can help you with this. But if you, you going into the finance market, you got access to a lot of people, and you can use that situation or in, to inform about your products. You can use the, to sell if you, but it's easy to find go into the more of the finance discussions. Uh, so that's, that's advice I would give to, don't lose the focus on the core business and explain what you're delivering, what's my business value. Mm -hmm. uh, because it tend to be a lot of a Q2 report from a financial perspective. Thank you. Now I would actually like to open up for questions from the audience. Who has the first question? Everything been answered? Yes, very good. I just wanted to uh, inquire because you talked about the possible ratios of investors in First North, and you said pension funds will invest and will invest always in future funds. Um, what is the ratio between these investor classes currently in the personal companies? Uh, well, 
the first North market has been very dormant. So you have two companies right now in the market. Uh, there you have uh, financial institutions also, but the liquidity is very low. So if we look at the, the main market, then the pension funds have some 35, 40% of the market. The mutual funds have some 25 to 30% of the market probably. Uh, and the individuals or at least uh, shareholders that are outside of the top 20 uh, shareholder list own some 15 to 20% of the market. And that might be the individual sphere. Uh, th that's an active market. I, th I think it, it's, it's not very, uh, you don't learn much from looking at the current first north market in Iceland. Uh, so, those are the numbers. We had another question here in the middle. Hi, uh, my name is Sigurd, I'm from Iceland Company, uh, Sigurd's colleague. I was uh, wondering, Jim, if you, you were uh, talking about the IPO, um, have you done any subsequent capital raises after you entered the market, so have you used this platform to raise? Yes, we have. And it's also easier to go out when, especially when we launch some key agreements who will need some additional investments to uh, put some go-to-market strategy earlier. To, so, and it's far easier to go to a existing group and ask for money when, uh, when you're there. So, and we have done that. Yeah, we, we, there, is a, there was a company who we acquired and then we put in our, um, uh, what do you call that in English? Uh, Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I guess you understand Swedish here. No, we, we, there's a, it's a company called, uh, and they have a lot, they have some of these companies and it's a company called Nerpin and Partners. There, there have a few companies with a lot of stock owners. So we acquired them, and at the same time, they guaranteed uh, some um, 40 million uh, from the main owners and all the, all the stock owners for the 3,000 owners. And then we acquired the company and turned our business into the company and listed that company. So we had, so that's why we could be faster. It, it shortened the process in terms of producing the material and sell our company. No, we didn't have, in fact, we, we, no, we didn't do that, but we do, did that afterwards. So we stayed some time there. Uh, because as, as we heard in the uh, beginning, there was a lot of companies that's been listed on First North in Sweden. Extremely crowded. So timing-wise, it was, oh, talking about timing, not the best time because we had like more than 100 companies coming out. And there's no way the funds can go through all these. So I think it could be good. <laughs> I, I would be glad if I would be here. You could have focus, you can have some interest. Anyway, everybody would look into it anyway. And that was a challenge in, stock, in, in Sweden with so many coming out at the same time. So this was a way to shortcut it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my name is Svenny, I'm from Max Medica. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, Jim, uh, about the uh, size of the company that is being listed, so, I mean, revenue-wise and employee-wise. So would you say that would be the minimum? Uh, size of a company to write the first one? I think the size of the company, as long as you can manage the process you're required to do. Uh, you can be a small company if you see there's a business possibility. I'm more into what is the possibility in two, three, four years for my product and where is it? If it's international possibility, uh, I would go uh, early. Well, it depends the, how you would like to control your company, but I will do it quite early. Uh, especially in IT where it moves so fast. Mm -hmm. And there are some areas right now is very interesting in, in the IT space. And then I would go uh, quite fast to the, to the stock market. What, what would you say would be, would be early? Is it like a million euros or 10 million euros or 50 employees or 10 employees? It could be from 10. Okay. It depends what you have. <laughs> well, we have... <laughs> 10 million kronor, 10 employees. In Sweden, we have a lot of gaming company who, who started very small, who became tremendous big in a very short time. Mm -hmm. 
So when you use the new way of scaling, mm -hmm. uh, when you use the net for, you can, you can see new opportunities. I guess you see that in your business in mm -hmm. the in the startup area, mm -hmm. and that's a way to get visibility. Uh, so if you, I've hired a lot of young people who train me how to act in this new space <laughs> and the behavior behind mm -hmm. internet and the behavior behind it. And it helps me a lot. So I would go. If I had a good idea, I would go early. Einar Gunnar. Yes, no, Einar Gunnar from Marion Bank. Um, so I think this is an important point on, I think that many people are actually, uh, at least the, the companies that are present here, they're thinking, should I list, should I not list, what is the right time? So uh, I would like to get a reflection from you, Jim, and for, uh, perhaps from Islam's Monkey as well, on kind of the mindset of the companies that list. If, if you compare Aksje Torjet and First North in Sweden, we see actually that many companies are even, they're not even generating revenue yet. And uh, I think this is a new perspective. <laughs> this is a new perspective for uh, many potential investors that just understanding that you don't actually need to have revenue, you just need to have a good framework, you, you have a good uh, roadmap, etc. So, uh, so the question is perhaps uh, for you, Jim, as a, as a suite, uh, just to Tell the to tell us here in Iceland, um, you know um, what, for instance, at least your perception of uh, how many uh, percent of companies, let's say, in actually and First North, are actually already making money or even generating revenue. Can just like, just this reflection on you know this different mindset. Oh, I don't know the percent how many is making money or not, but uh, it's a good point because we, if you have a company who's not making money. As we are not making money right now, we are selling, but we are still we haven't come up to black figures. It it maybe attracts some type of investors. So the traditional, I would say, not using that, but but tradition in Sweden, using the traditional banks, they will go say, when do you make revenue? The first question: Why are not you making? When you will, and can I see your budget? But when you come to more uh, uh, private. And what I see in, in the stock market, they are, they're looking more into, so what, what is the business idea? What is your, what is comp com competitors? Why will you win this case? What, so they will, they look another way on it. And they, they, so they are willing to invest even though we don't show or companies doesn't show revenue. And I see more and more of these companies. And that's what, uh, when we sold the company, one of the guys moved to Palo Alto, stayed for four years. And so we have a good network there. And there's a total other mindset in how they look at the business, even small business. And we are, in Sweden, we are more conservative, so we would like to see that you, traditionally been that, but I see a change in, 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 in uh, they're willing to invest earlier in companies who have a possibility. Uh, hi, my name is Ragnar from Ashley Startups. I work with Salve. Uh, we work closely with startups, especially early stage. Uh, and I'm just wondering, maybe from your point, Sarbjörn and Sjöldur, uh, are you as certified advisors doing anything to promote this area, this market, as an opportunity for startups? Because I find that a lot of startups that we talk with don't even look at this as a possibility. They think, okay, we'll just go directly to the funds and ask for money. So are you doing anything? And if not, do you think you could be doing anything? Um, I mean, we're working a lot with startups uh, at KPMG, um, and uh, uh, I, think, I think we have sort of active agreements with about 70 startups that, are, that, that we're helping out, uh, providing, <coughs> providing um, uh, free advice to a certain extent, and, and helping them sort of building their infrastructure. Um, so, but but in that in that area, there are only a few where we I think see that that first not that at this stage is is viable. There is you know there needs to be some uh, some development prior to considering this. So I think there is a, you know there, there needs to be some some development. You can't go on sort of year one probably unless you have a, a very, something very uh, very special. But it is important what Jim is saying that profitability is not a necessity, which is you know one thing for growth companies extremely important, and and actual size is is, is not a condition either. So it's a question of you know uh, being being ready in the sense that that you can demonstrate you have an equity story and can demonstrate that you can uh, move into profitability, grow fast over a foreseeable future. You have you have been built some sort of foundation 
you know, credibility and, 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 and you have some success, success stories in your bag. And that's when you're ready. But, but it is important, and I think for, 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 for this group here, I think a lot of people think you have to be profitable, you have to be of a minimum size. That should not be the case. But however, we have to keep in mind that First North is not existing almost today. You know, we, we have to develop that market. And we have to be smart about it. And the first entrants need to be very exciting for, it, for the whole market to really kick off, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, yes, I mean, we are uh, in dialogue and, and working for uh, startup companies. Uh, I think one of the issues there is the listing process is, is a, can be a quite a cumbersome process, time consuming, uh, and many of the startup companies uh, uh, would like to go another route because of the complexities or, or the time they would have to spend on, on the listing process. Uh, often they don't have the infrastructure, you need some infrastructure and, and education within the company that might suit those companies a bit later on possibly. Uh, but I mean, it's an interesting point and, and thinking backwards, I mean, uh, we had uh, listed funds at one stage some 10, 15 years ago. Uh, then, we had the, then we had funds listed on the exchange which owned uh, part of smaller IT companies and so forth. And I mean, that's something that, that could be a way for, for uh, smaller startup companies to enjoy uh, the benefits of being listed indirectly uh, and also a way for investors to, to get a diversification into a bit of a risky sector for a smaller amount of money than otherwise needed. That c could be a way. Okay. One last question. Well, if not, then I just hope that Portland Co. are ready for the flock of, of companies that are now coming to list on First North. But on behalf of Nasdaq Iceland, I'd like to thank all of you for being with us today and the panelists for your valuable insights. And I hope you all enjoy the day. Thank you. <laughs>